here to talk about three things. One, to honor the passion that brought us all here today, to respect the challenging work that it takes to own and run an organic farm, and to offer a way of seeing ourselves in the future that allows us to discover our authenticity and become more resilient as we move forward into the next generation of farming communities. So, in case it isn't obvious, Elliot Coleman is my father. Some of you might be wondering what it is like to be Elliot Coleman's daughter, so I will share a little story with you. My father first visited my farm in Colorado in mid-October of 2009. The afternoon sun was shining across the alfalfa fields, illuminating the three rolling thunder movable greenhouses where a fall crop of hardy salad greens and spinach lay under the protection of quick hoops and remay. It was near, nearing dinner time, my boys were hungry, and my father and I ventured out to the beds armed with sharp knives and bins to harvest a spinach salad for supper. As we began picking leaf by leaf across the bed from one another and engaged in lighthearted conversation about best spinach, winter varieties to grow, harvest techniques, I began to notice him inching ahead of me. So I quickened my pace a little to keep up. Then he quickened his. <laughs> Before I knew it, we were racing each other, rapidly filling our bins and completing the entire row in record time. Just as we finished, he glanced into my bin and said with a gleam in his eye, looks like I have more spinach than you. I thought to myself, seriously? He's only been perfecting his harvest technique for the last 40 years. <laughs> he loves me, of course, and he, we've always had this playful, competitive dynamic between us, but I'll let you in on a little secret never let me win. <laughs> so when I entered the farming world five years ago and found myself at organic conferences, whether he was there or not, he always felt like he was not the elephant, but that gigantic prize-winning 18-pound onion in the room. <laughs> Hard to compete with that. <laughs> So I also think back to the tender moments as a child when we would spend afternoons together in the potting greenhouse at the mountain school in Berkshire, Vermont. There he would patiently teach me how to press soil blocks, seed each depression by hand, pot on delicate eggplant seedlings, tell the difference between newly germinated tomato or pepper seedling, and even humor me as I sculpted magical fairy castles in the moist bin of potting soil when I would become bored with the work. Many times I would notice his enormous rubber boots in the corner, and I would eagerly place my little feet inside with the top swallowing my thighs, and I would begin laughing, stumbling between the plant benches and giggling, look at me, Papa, I'm a farmer. So fast forward 30 years later, and of quite a few non-farming detours in between, here I find myself in front of all of you, the early pioneers and the new generation. And having recently discovered that I spent the last five years in Colorado, stumbling along bravely and not so effortlessly in those still enormously large rubber boots. And with that realization, my journey as a farmer has taken me in a new direction. As I follow my own path, discover my authentic voice, and learn what it means to me to be a real farmer in the 21st century. So what does it mean to be a real farmer? That is the question I want to talk about this morning. And in particular, I want to talk about what I've come to understand, or how I've come to understand that farmers can only benefit and grow from sharing their stories, from caring for the land, supporting themselves and each other, educating and serving their communities. That farmers can only benefit and grow from sharing their stories, from caring for the land, supporting themselves and each other, educating and serving their communities, trusting in nature and in human nature, and ultimately owning their own boots. My father's philosophy of real farming, real food, has been a constant in my life, never more so than when I started my farm in Colorado. 
This idea of the word real in relation to farming is what spoke to me. If we were to strip food and farming down to their most basic elements, such as fresh, unprocessed nourishment, and the act of growing or raising food through caring for the land, there really isn't anything too complicated about what we do. But how the word real is interpreted, interpre interpreted from, to form the basis of our farming philosophy varies from farm to farm and farmer to farmer. Real farming, for instance, for my father, is the opposite of hubristic farming, which seeks to replace the natural world with artificial inputs. Real farming acknowledges nature's impeccable design and seeks to nurture the soil and work within this natural system. This is the framework uh, and that the pioneers of the early generation and the back-to-land movement of my father's generation sought to establish in the public eye, thanks to their tireless efforts to relearn and refine the technical expertise of how to grow and raise food sustainably, our movement now has the credibility, media exposure, general public awareness, and forward momentum to affect considerable positive change in agriculture, both on and in the ground, as well as in the halls of government. But as we race to solve problems, innovate new ideas, hone our technical proficiency, I believe we also need to intentionally cultivate and nurture our emotional intelligence as farmers. In their book, Emotional Intelligence 2.0, Dr. Travis Bradbury and Jean Greaves describe their subject as interpersonal relationships, those we have with other people, and intrapersonal relationships, the one that we have with ourselves, as the single biggest predictor of performance in the workplace and the strongest driver of leadership and personal excellence. It is also the foundation of critical work skills, such as stress tolerance, decision making, accountability, time management, flexibility, customer service, teamwork, empathy, and communication. Through their studies and surveys of over 500,000 people, Bradbury and Greaves concluded that emotional intelligence predicts two-thirds of job performance, but only a third of people are actually aware of their emotions when they happen. I don't know if that sounds familiar. What I found so interesting about this research is that it was centered around employees of Fortune 500 companies who mainly work in relatively controlled, indoor, air-conditioned office environments. Not exactly the setting for the everyday farmer. But before I continue, why would we even need emotional intelligence? We're farmers. We're not soft. We're tough. We're stoic. We're independent. We're outliers. We work incredibly long hours, exhausted to the bone, and we get things done whether we feel like it or not. Well, all that may be true, but in his wife's book, The Dirty Life, Mark Kimball of Essex Farm sums it up quite nicely when he says, organic farms typically do not fail from bankruptcy, but from burnout and divorce. Farming is an incredibly challenging and all-consuming profession in its own right, but for many of us, it is also a lifestyle and the boundaries between our professional and personal lives, especially when we are physically and mentally drained, are often difficult to distinguish and can sometimes lead to unpleasant and unanticipated results. Having experienced my own burnout farming, I can attest to how the best laid plans are easily overturned. During the process of envisioning and creating my farm, I was armed with a warrior-like attitude, plenty of determination, more energy than the Energizer Bunny, all combined with considerable farming competency I'd learned through osmosis as a child, and an extensive wealth of knowledge only a phone call away. But I also was a new mother with two young boys, and I was in the middle of a shaky relationship. Nonetheless, I hearkened back to my father's indomitable spirit and forged ahead to create Divide Creek Farm. Located in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado at 6,200 feet, the farm comprised a total of 200 acres, mostly flood irrigated pasture, which was hayed annually, and supported a small herd of grass-fed Black Angus cattle. With a 25-kilowatt grid-tied solar system, the farm was considered carbon neutral for up to five adults. I carved out about a two-acre piece of flat land for growing mixed vegetable crops using three Rolling Thunder movable high tunnels and a plant starting green. I focus on producing high quality four season vegetables using minimal inputs and mostly supported by hand labor, two to three interns each season, 
and often the help of family and friends. Since the farm was located far from the nearest town, I was committed to relationship marketing and direct consumer sales at a local summer and winter farmer's market. I quickly developed a successful Four Season Farm model and a loyal following because I could be consistent with high quality produce often available weeks ahead of other farmers and in the spring and then also throughout the winter months through the protection of high season, excuse me, season extension techniques. One of my proudest moments was the development of the Green Stream, a 1967 Airstream Caravel retrofitted as a walk-in cooler and charged off the solar system before being loaded with produce, driven to market, and displayed as a self-sufficient and sustainable market booth. <laughs> but for all the creativity, the success, and the innovation developed at my farm, I was completely drained and frustrated and quite often felt as if I was being pulled in different directions or having to choose either the farm or being a mother or a partner or a friend. My experience felt baffling. I had all the drive, the experience, the know-how, and the resources, but some of, somehow that all didn't quite add up. What was I missing? This introspection was an important turning point when I realized the value of applying the idea of emotional intelligence to help mediate the uncertainties and unpredictability of the farming lifestyle. Now that I've had time to reflect and gain perspective and learn from sharing stories with many other farmers, I can more fully appreciate the need to cultivate emotional intelligence just as much as our technical ability and drive. My sister likes to say that I've done a ton of internal composting over the last year. Turning and adding and turning some more, an accumulated mass of jumbled thoughts, feelings, and other things best broken down and recycled into a wealth of emotional black gold, fertile beginnings for new growth and exploration, and a beautiful and timely flowering of uh, purpose to share with the farming community. One, of this, one result of this composting is an idea I have been developing in hopes of giving myself and other farmers a simple and clear framework for cultivating emotional intelligence, as well as a reminder of what it means to be a farmer. I call this my Real Farmers Manifesto. Why a manifesto? Not only is a manifesto a public declaration of intentions, but the word manifest as a noun is defined as a list of a ship's cargo. So it poses the question, as we take this voyage as farmers, what do we take along in our ship's cargo to ensure a meaningful and successful journey? What do we want to manifest? After doing some more internal composting, I developed a manifest list with nine items. One for each of the letters of the word manifesto in the form of an acronym, and an easy way to remind myself of what I carry with me. I will illustrate each statement with either a personal farming story of my own or one collected from other farmers, because it is this simple act of sharing farming stories that gives this idea so much depth, inspiration, and purpose. So let's begin. M, make connections. I regard Jack Laser of Butterworks Farm to be one of the original innovative pioneers of the early organic movement, so it seems very fitting that I begin by sharing his story about making those first connections with old time farmers and then paying it forward to the next generation. In 1974, he wrote, I was a starry-eyed 23-year-old wannabe farmer visiting my sweetheart Ann out in Wisconsin. We went to a farm auction and bought a set of harness for a future dream farm and homestead. After the sale, we were approached by a very friendly farmer who wanted to buy the collar to put a mirror in it to hang in his living room. We got to talking and found out that he milked 30 cows on a small farm and he still used workhorses to spread his manure. We didn't want to sell the horse collar, but we asked if we could come visit him on his farm. He introduced himself as John Ace and told us to come on over and he would show us around. Being from out east, neither Ann nor I had any family in Wisconsin, but the Aces made us a part of their family and taught us all about a type of small-scale agriculture 
that was quickly disappearing even in 74. We moved back to Vermont the next year and brought with us a pretty good understanding of Midwestern dairy farming, where you grew the grain as well as the hay for your cows. It was this foundation of knowledge that gave me the vision to pursue a path of self-sufficient dairy farming. 38 years have passed since that farm auction and many more individuals have helped us along the way. I have recently had the opportunity to help others on their paths. I was contacted by a young woman named Mara who wanted to learn about growing grain for poultry. We met at UVM and within five minutes we were instant friends. She is only the latest in a long string of individuals whom we have helped and inspired. As farmers, we have a relationship with the land and with others who love the land as much as we do. And it is these personal connections that are so vital to our way of life. Uh, my first intern, Elise, recently shared this story on another type of connection becoming popular in young farmer circles these days, namely weed dating. And no, this does not involve the weed cannabis. She says, I never thought I would go weed dating. And by that I mean I would totally stand by to see who shows up, but I would not participate. Which is exactly what I tried to do last fall at the Common Ground Fair. I don't know what exactly fell off. Maybe it seemed a little too contrived. Everyone standing around fidgeting, holding a labeled mason jar in anticipation that a potential suitor might leave their name and number. It felt overly self-conscious, but then I rationalized, what with all the fantasies of living off the land and Brooklyn hipsters and flannel? Who doesn't want to date a farmer? During the fairgrounds roundup of more single victims, I ate an ice cream cone and watched as my friend took the plunge. Intrigued, I followed the whole group to a weedy row of Swiss chard, and with legitimate prodding from my friend, I reluctantly joined in. I mean, why not? What did I have to lose? But here's the thing. I did not meet my life partner. I talked to a bunch of non-straight males and a bunch of really rad women. If anything, weed dating was more like a show and tell of this is what young farmers look like. I doubt we did a good job weeding either. But this is exactly the kind of playful hijinks young farmers need. And sometimes I joke that what young farmers really need is a good Yenta matchmaker. A, ask for support. I've known farmer Rose, Eric Rosendahl of Mark, Rockville Market Farm in Starksboro, Vermont since childhood. Our fathers were college roommates and they even spent a summer in the 60s biking across country on relatively obscure Italian 10 speeds wearing nothing but t-shirts, a pair of lederhosen, and chasing an insatiable sense of adventure. Here, Eric describes his experience as a farmer asking for support. He says, I've owned a farm for 17 years now, and I spent the first 13 years trying to figure out how to get out. But these days, I can't imagine ever retiring. It's an exciting time to be a farmer, and I'm very proud of what we've been able to accomplish. Shortly after we bought the farm in the early 2000s, things took a turn for the worse. Crops failed, cash did not flow, and we were unable to make mortgage payments. Needless to say, it was a really rough period. One autumn day, we went for a long walk, and I had an epiphany. I realized I had no idea what I was doing. It was very liberating. And I started asking a lot of questions. Later that fall, I went on a farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange to Honduras with farmer Richard Wiswell. We spent two weeks together traveling and talking. He offered to help, and I'm pretty sure we were his first consulting gig. With his help, we streamlined our business, focusing only on profitable crops. One thing we learned is it's hard to let go. We had attachments to many of the crops we had grown successfully in the fertile, sandy soils of the Intervale. Having the support of a third person, essentially a tiebreaker, helped to make decisions and became a powerful tool. I still talk with Richard on a regular basis, and after all these years of farming and finding the courage to ask for support, I am very comfortable with the notion that I still have a lot to learn. N, nurture yourself. I first met urban farmer Zach Pickens of River Park Farm during a visit to New York City in the winter of 2012. He farms in potting soil filled milk crates lined with weed cloth and stacked into raised beds in an empty building lot next to the River Park restaurant. 
where all the produce only travels a few hundred feet to be prepared and served as delicious and as local as it gets cuisine. He says, I am one of the very fortunate farmers in this world that is being provided with health care by my employer. I finally took advantage of this after nine months of strenuous labor and 14 hour days. I was having stress and exhaustion issues. Imagine that from farming. And I sought the advice of a very good um, holistic doctor in the city. And I couldn't have imagined the answer would be this easy. She took one look at me, I'm tall and thin, about 6'3", and asked for confirmation. You said you're a farmer, right? I said, yes. She replied, and you eat regularly, right? I said, I work at a farm next to a restaurant, so it's hard not to do and do so well. She said, well, how much? Because you should be eating at least 5,000 calories per day with a lot more protein and good fats, too. After giving me a routine physical and running blood tests, that was the beginning and the end of her advice to me. Eat more. Eat more than double the average recommended calorie intake for adults in the US. And I can say with 100% certainty that her advice, while incredibly basic, was the difference between the way I felt in 2001 and the way I felt in 2011 and 2012. This simple tip gave me the energy I needed to not only get my job done, but to also get home without passing out from exhaustion every night. Working in such a strenuous job, I had forgotten to check in with my body and make sure I was taking care of myself. So it had become a negative feedback loop of sorts. The more I ignored my body and the more stressed I got, the less energy I had to remember things like take care of my body. I innovate and inspire ideas. Mike and Katie Bollinger were interns at my dad's farm a few years ago and now have two children and operate a successful farm, Root River Farm in Decorah, Iowa. Mike is also founder of Four Season Tools, which is developing movable greenhouses for small scale farmers. He shares his story about inspired and innovative designs for the farm. He writes, did you know that no one manufactures gates for a deer fence opening seven feet by 16 feet that sits on a downhill slant? Fancy that. Gates are designed with right angles and are meant to function on nearly level ground. We came to this realization as we were trying to finish erecting a four acre deer fence on our hillside farm. We were on the verge of becoming the laughing stock of the neighborhood. Are you trying to keep them in or are you trying to keep them out? And judging by the size and familiarity of the herd, now is the moment to figure out our gate solution or take up deer farming. Frankly, the thousand dollars that we were quoted to install a couple of traditional deer gates did not seem like a workable figure for our farm. So we knew we needed to think quick. What materials did we have in the shed that be fashioned into gates? Then it came to us, a simple solution that would cost only $50 per gate. Cables, turnbuckles, a handful of wire thimbles and wire clips, and a few strategically placed eye bolts. It was a sort of aha moment, a deep satisfaction in knowing that once again we figure out our own solution and with parts we had already laying around. Sometimes I ponder why we farm given that fact and that we are not suffering from a surplus of financial freedom and that the hours are long and hard to plan the rest of our lives around, and that each normal farm day provides us with many challenges. But the one thing that really keeps the fun in farming for us is the problem solving, the idea that each system we're creating can constantly be improved upon, the idea that simple solutions exist. We look out at our fields, imagining what they might provide, all the while remembering that we have what they have already reaped for us. No, we can't control the weather, but yes, we can innovate and adapt. Farming fun, F. My father was the farm manager of the mountain school in Berkshire, Vermont for much of the 80s. And this is a story I remember about how my father always had a knack for putting the fun in farming. It was approaching the summer equinox in June and a heat wave had descended on Garden Hill. A young and boisterous summer crew, mostly made up of former students, had been hired by my dad to help with the summer work. I had eagerly volunteered, not so much that I wanted to farm, but at the age of 13, and much to my dad's dismay, I knew there would be cute boys to get to know. A group of us were gathered in the rows of English LPs, having been instructed to quickly harvest an overabundance of plump, juicy pods before the intense noon sun and mugginess sapped our energy. 
After the last pea was picked, we heaved our heavy bins on our shoulders, slowly made our way back down to the dining hall for lunch. No one talked or ate much, and we draped our limp bodies across the wooden benches, anticipating an excruciating afternoon of hand weeding the newly germinated carrot beds. Upon noticing our fatigue, my dad, in his typical jovial fashion, said he had a fun idea. Hey, let's skip the weeding, guys. And instead, let's spend the afternoon shelling those peas for freezing. Even better, let's watch one of my favorite movies while we work, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Everyone cheered, grabbed their bins of peas, large stainless steel bowls, and set to shelling pods, one by one, as we gathered around the TV and VCR. Laughing and smiling with delight, my fingers deftly prying open pods and sliding fat peas into bowls, I noticed my dad disappear from the dining hall. And then magically, just as the credits rolled on the screen and the last pea fell from its pod, he suddenly emerged from the kitchen, bearing a handful of spoons and six frosty pints of Ben and Jerry's ice cream for our reward. E, educate your community. Caitlin Barasa is a young and enthusiastic farmer at Rock Bottom Ranch, an educational farm located in Basalt, Colorado. And we met a couple of years ago through my consulting work for the nonprofit. Here she shares her story about educating her community. She writes, it's my first time living on a ranch in Colorado and working with livestock, and also, hands down, my first glimpse at the sweaty and intense and intensely gratifying work of raising meat. My co-rancher and I are successful at raising 1,500 broilers on pasture using a Joel Salatin method. We sell the frozen birds at local shops around the area, barely breaking even financially, the education and the experience being our true profit. But fortunately, the ranch is a community center that focuses on environmental studies and sustainable agriculture. We run dozens of summer camps each year to teach kids about the importance of learning the story behind food and a bit about how to grow it, too. As we refine our broiler enterprise, we are able to incorporate the camp kids and put them right to work. They water, feed, rotate, herd our broilers each day, taking pride in their contributions and asking endless questions along the way. Is this like the chicken I eat for dinner? Are you sure I can't just name this one and take her home? Are all these birds really going to be killed next week? Is this how all chickens live? The answers can't come fast enough. Yes, no, yes, no. And if they stand still long enough, the kids that is, we have the opportunity to go deeper. They begin connecting the dots and asking their parents about the chicken they eat at home. And then the word got out that, to the local Hispanic community that there was fresh meat available at reasonable prices. Whole families would come out to see the live galinas for themselves and select the heaviest, tastiest birds right out of the pasture. They would buy 20 or 30 at a time, spend an afternoon plucking and gutting, and then share the goods with family and friends. No butchering instructions needed. These folks have been processing broilers since childhood and even taught us a thing or two. The sense of community grew as more and more families arrived for fresh or frozen chicken and as we led farm tours for visitors during the day and talked to them about the importance of ethically raised food. People from all diverse backgrounds, all paying us a visit to acquaint themselves with one tiny story within the massive story of food. They were there to learn, but it was the ranch staff that by far learned the most that summer. We were their students, even as they were ours. S. Serve your community. I met farmer Corey Pierce of Bread and Butter Farm at a high tunnel conference this past November. She gave an excellent presentation about winter greens production, and later that day, we were sitting at a table together along with her five-year-old son, Henry. Noticing him fidget in his chair and missing my two boys, I quietly showed him how to fold a piece of paper into an origami balloon. He was delighted, of course. Corey recently told me that to this day, he still talks about my magic paper trick. Here she shares her story about serving her community. She says, I am a first generation family farmer. Farming entered my life during high school when I got a job at working at a farm in southern New Hampshire. I instantly fell in love with the hard work, the teamwork, the fact that my work directly impacted the family I worked for. The, this real work was powerful to me. 
I dreamed of farming for myself after that very first year and continued to work there for another six seasons. Fifteen years later, I finally purchased and started my own diversified farm. At only three and a half years old, we are committed to creating a true community farm, one that nurtures the soil, plants, animals, farmers, and the surrounding community. From the beginning, starting out was exciting, scary, and full of unanticipated surprises. In order to make it possible for our farm to get off the ground, our family needed to access the amazing Vermont state programs, health insurance and child care resources included. Initially, I felt a little guilty about this. I felt as if I was just taking, and I thought maybe we were doing something wrong if we couldn't make a farm business successful without the additional help. I also questioned the long-term viability of our business model if we had to rely on this extra help. Recently, however, I have been reminded in countless ways of the positive impact a business like ours has in a community and how valuable it becomes beyond those financial implications. As a community farm, we attract hundreds of people each week to purchase our food, to visit our animals, to explore our greenhouses and gardens. We provide field trips and tours to local schools, and we host sold-out burger nights in the summer. Although small in the scheme of the whole regional economy, we are part of an important network of local businesses. Farming, among so many other things, has shown me directly how my family and I can be supported by our community while simultaneously serving our community. T, trust in nature. Michael and Joyce Plain are old family friends and farmers from way down under in Gundaroo, Australia. I spend part of my year after high school woofing at their farm and battling one of their worst farming foes, cockatoos. Here Joyce shares her story about the lessons learned from nature's vandals. She writes, for years we have battled cabbage white butterfly with natural pesticides, various row cover barriers and appropriate cool season timing and now, after two years of releasing some tiny parasitic wasps as soon as the butterflies emerge in spring, we find ourselves going into winter with a healthy crop of brassicas and not a single white butterfly to be seen. But this success does not keep my blood pressure from rising. At least 40 large and glorious white cockatoos are ready to descend on my fields. I can appreciate that our apples are attractive to bird seed eaters, and I'm happy to net our orchard trees to keep out parrots that not only peck out the seed from immature fruit, but destroy the whole tree in the process. But I have never understood the odd attraction that cockatoos have to our vegetables. These birds simply adore the senseless prank of snapping off young cabbages, onions, garlic, and corn, all the while leaving the edible debris littering the ground. Later in the season, if there are any corn plants remaining, they of course glide in, begin nibbling at the outside of the stand a few cobs at a time, and then arrive the next day having put the word out to all their friends, ready to demolish the entire lot. Just to make life even more difficult, cockatoos are valuable, fiercely protected, and highly intelligent birds. The glittering CDs and disco balls that adorn our garden at this time of year have to be installed at just the right moment and moved around frequently if there's any hope that will work as deterrence. Now come to the last of the manifestos, manifestations, the O for own your story. Michael James Meyer, after proving how farming in Gotham can succeed in, as a rooftop farmer in Brooklyn Grange, New York, decided to venture into the suburbs of New Jersey where he started the Homestead CSA, Seven Arrows East. Here he shares an example of owning his story. He writes, after college, I spent several years working in the advertising industry to pay off my extensive student loans. Through hard work, long hours, and a little luck, I quickly climbed the corporate ladder and ended up in my own corner office. Zeros on my paychecks, fancy clothes, and dining regularly at fine restaurants. Dressed in a suit and tie and running around Manhattan from meeting to presentation to pitch, flying weekly to LA, to Chicago, to London, I must have seemed to be living the life, but all along, I had a secret identity. One with dirt under his fingernails, stained overalls, and a sweet smell of barn and horseshit. My inner farmer debuted when he decided to buy plants for every desk in the company offices and become caretaker. Guess he's just a green thumb kind of guy. 
Then my alter ego started shopping at farmer's markets on lunch breaks and between client meetings, lugging around bags full of kale and kohlrabi. On evenings and weekends, he tended to a, a container garden, small at first, and then occupying every square inch of windowsill, terrace, and rooftop space his apartment offered. He ate his own Gotham-grown tomatoes, lettuces, zucchini all summer long. He read and reread farming tomes, Coleman's, Jeevan's, Logston, Salatin, and started dreaming of the day when he would gaze down his own field somewhere, counting down the days till the last frost. More and more, he paid down that student loan debt, and with every less last extra paycheck dollar, deciding not to spend it on those fancy shoes, but to swirl it away to buy muck boots instead. And then one day, the debt disappeared. That chilly late January day, just as farmers across the country were working on their crop plans and schedules for the coming season, my inner farmer put the finishing touches on his. That day, he loosened his necktie, hung up his suit jacket, untied his shiny shoes, and gave his two weeks final notice. Now it was time to pursue the farm dream in earnest. Some years later, with real dirt under my fingernails, real stained overalls, and a horse shit smell I really just can't wash away, despite my best attempts, I'm beginning my first season as my own farm business owner. And through, though sometimes I look back fondly to the paychecks, the vacation time, and the clean clothes, I, I look forward much more to that impending last frost and the sweet smell of tomato starts going into the ground. So I have shared with you quite a collection of ideas about a real farmer's manifesto. Each idea illustrated by real stories from real farmers with the goal to encourage a larger conversation about the heart of farming as the next generation takes up this work. I understand how challenging it is to farm. I also know how difficult it can be to have the courage to speak from the heart. But that is where our stories come from, and that is what it takes to discover our authenticity as farmers. My call to action is to unearth beyond all the farming skill, the planning, the politics, the economics, your authenticity as a farmer by sharing your stories in an attempt to cultivate your emotional intelligence, water your creativity, build trust and resilience in your farming ability, and ultimately to strengthen your community of farmers. Everyone here, the early pioneers and the new generation, has incredible value to offer farming world simply by owning and sharing your farming stories. So I invite all of you to consider what are your stories for inspiring your manifesto as a real farmer. And now I leave you with a photo of Gumpa and his beloved grandsons, Bodie and Hayden, and a passage from one of their favorite bedtime stories, Marjorie Williams, The Velveteen Rabbit. So when my sons ask me what it means to be a real farmer, this is my response. What is real, asked the rabbit one day. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the wise old skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. It doesn't happen all at once you become, it takes a long time. Generally, by the time you're real, most of your hair has been loved off and your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all because once you are real, you can't be ugly except to people who don't understand. Thank you.